What we're studying in this course is differential calculus. And differential calculus has to do with lots of different things, but the thread that ties them all together is that we're studying rates of change of functions. One of the easiest examples of rate of change to get your head around is velocity. Velocity is just the rate of change of position with respect to time. Calculating average velocity is probably something that you've done a lot in your career. It's just the change in position over the change of time. And again, you can always think of kilometers per hour. But whenever we take an average, we're prone to losing information. If you have an object and you are taking the average velocity over an interval of time, and in that interval, the object starts and stops at the same place, then its average velocity is going to be zero, even if it moved around. This is useful perhaps for convincing your parents that you are home all night, but it's not super useful for determining the velocity of a moving object and really tracking what's going on. To find the instantaneous velocity, we imagine taking the average velocity over smaller and smaller and smaller intervals. The smaller the interval in general, the more accurate your average is. Average and instantaneous velocity have some geometric analogs. On the left, we have the secant line to a curve through points P and Q, and it's just a straight line through points P and Q. And the reason we care about it is because the slope of the secant line gives the average rate of change between P and Q. Remember to calculate slope, it's rise over run or change in Y over change in X. And that's exactly the same calculation we use to find average rate of change. If we imagine taking a secant line over two points that are closer and closer and closer together, what we get is the tangent line. It's a straight line it passes through a particular point on our curve and it should have the same slope as the curve. Now maybe you haven't really had slope defined to you for uh, something that's not a line, but the idea is this. If you were a very tiny speck on this curve, that curve would look to you like a straight line in the same way that us tiny specks on the round earth seem to observe a flat earth. If you were a tiny speck, and you were on this curve and you thought that it was flat, the flat line that you would imagine you were on is the tangent line. The slope of the tangent line gives the instantaneous rate of change of your function at P. We're going to use in the next class this notation of a limit, and I just wanna go over the notation. This funny line on the top means the limit as x goes to two of f of x is 15. Remember, we have some function, and it depends on x or whatever variable, so as x changes, the output of the function changes. And what we're trying to encompass here, what we're trying to describe is that as x gets closer and closer to 2, my function gets closer and closer to 15. Now crucially, we don't care what actually happens at 2. If this is an interesting limit, usually something weird is happening at, for example, x is equal to 2. The examples we used before of average and instantaneous velocity, you can't make an average velocity calculation if your time interval has length 0. You end up dividing by 0 and that doesn't make any sense. So this is one reason why a limit would be useful. Sometimes we can't actually put our finger directly on what happens at x equals 2, but we can say as we get closer and closer and closer to x equals 2, our function gets closer and closer and closer to 15.